19-year-old Alua Toyin Salau, also known as Toyin, was born on August 27, 2000, in Tallahassee, Florida, to Nigerian parents. Raised as a devout Christian, she was the youngest member of her church choir while growing up. She graduated from Lincoln High School in 2018, and following graduation, she studied cosmetology at Lively Technical College while simultaneously starting her business in hairdressing and modeling. In 2019, she enrolled at Tallahassee Community College while still at Lively and intended on studying law at Florida A&M University afterwards. She also had a keen taste for fashion as she taught herself how to sew, paint, and design her own clothes. Throughout her upbringing, however, she had experienced years of sexual violence, family instability, and isolation. Nonetheless, she was described by her mother as a good child, an avid reader, and someone who spoke about what she believed in. And this was evident during the peak of the 2020 Black Lives Matter protests, where the world was introduced to Toyin. She very quickly rose to prominence on social media after speaking out against the murder of 38-year-old Tony McDade, a black trans man, at a protest. On May 27th, just two days after George Floyd's death, a responding officer shot and killed Tony McDade after they alleged that he pulled a gun on them. However, witnesses tell a different story of officers calling him the N-word and demanding that he stop moving to only shoot him after he stopped moving. With tensions heightened, this sent the community of Tallahassee over the edge for justice on McDade's behalf. At the protest, Toyin expressed her emotions. Nah, can't nobody silence me. I just want, it's not that all lives don't matter, but right now, our lives matter, black, black lives, matter. lives matter. Yes. Black trans lives matter. Yes. Trans lives matter. Yes. Because guess what? We all minorities, but right now, like, let's focus on the person who got killed. Tony McDay was a black trans man. Okay? Amen. We're not doing this. We're doing this for him. We're doing this for our brothers and our sisters who got shot, but we're doing this for every black person. Because at the end of the day, I cannot take my fucking skin color off. I cannot mask this shit, okay? Everywhere I fucking go, I'm profiled whether I like it or not. That ain't right. Like, I'm looked at whether I like it or not. That ain't right. Being skin, bruh. We love it. This shit, I can't take this shit off. So guess what? I'm going to die about it. Yes, I'm going to die about my fucking skin. You cannot take my fucking blackness away from me. My blackness is not for your fucking consumption, nigga. It's not. It's not. Okay? It's not. And y'all need to listen. It's like I said, it's okay to be angry. Use wisdom. Don't move stupidly and get yourself hurt. You already seen we all in this together. I, I didn't mean to like divide anybody. We all in this together. This put her on the map of social media, which only made her even more visible when she went off in a series of tweets on the afternoon of June 6th leaving those who knew her and those who didn't more concerned. Toyin talked about a black man who molested her that day. She said the man offered her a ride to the church where she'd been staying. After offering her a shower at his place, she took the offer and, in her words, trusted the Holy Spirit to keep her safe. Here are the tweets from her account. After she escaped, her last tweet was her own description of the suspect. She reported the incident to the Tallahassee police, but they informed her that more evidence would be needed to charge the assailant. However, strangely, that same day, she was reported missing by her family.
word got around fast to the Tallahassee community and social media on her disappearance. Friends, family, and the Tallahassee Community Action Agency hosted multiple search parties and distributed flyers in search of Toyin. The demonstrators searched for hours, carried flashlights, and even asked for medics to join them in case they found her hurt. All of this seemed strange and unlike her to not respond to anybody, especially after her last tweets. The community was shaken, but soon they would receive answers to her whereabouts. While Toyin was missing, another woman was reported missing in Tallahassee just days after on June 11th, 75-year-old Victoria Vicky Sims. She was an active AARP Florida volunteer for more than 10 years. She was described as fierce and a friendly face to those who knew her. Two days later on June 13th, a family friend of Vicky stopped by her house to check on her when she noticed she left her front door ajar. Her friend called the police and upon talking to Vicky's family, they said they last heard from her two days prior. In just a few hours, a fleet of officers were dispatched with search dogs the same night. The Tallahassee police descended on a home after tracing Victoria Sims' cell phone to a specific address. They noticed Victoria's car was stuck in mud outside of her home. They noticed Victoria's car was stuck in mud outside of the home. A sheet was placed over the back of her Toyota and the license plate was bent up. When inside, they found her body under a bloody sheet in a bedroom with her arms and feet tied up. Investigators later believed her home was ransacked, car stolen, and she was kidnapped and murdered in this home. However, as they continued searching the home, they sent out a search dog to see if the suspect was hiding somewhere. But instead, they stumbled upon Toyin's body under a pile of leaves in the woods behind the house. She had been missing for a week. With two bodies discovered, all fingers pointed to one suspect and the owner of the home, Aaron Glee Jr. Forty-nine-year-old Aaron Glee spent much of his life in the West Palm Beach area of Florida. When he was three, his father and uncle passed away after their car crashed into a palm tree. He was arrested for the first time right before he turned 18 and quickly graduated to more serious crimes, armed robbery, grand theft auto, and drug offenses. Throughout his life, he had three marriages that all ended in divorces and four children. He held a long rap sheet of more than three dozen arrests, including domestic violence complaints. He struggled with homelessness and eventually was living in a decrepit rented house on Monday Road on Tallahassee's east side. He also knew 75-year-old Victoria Sims. How they met is unknown, but her family said that she often prepared meals for Aaron and delivered them to his home. He also did not own a vehicle, so he would often obtain transportation through Victoria. He was arrested on May 29, 2020, just days prior to Toyn's disappearance, on a charge of aggravated battery after an officer spotted him kicking a woman in the stomach. The victim told the police that the two had been drinking and he propositioned her for a sexual favor. She refused, which triggered Aaron to become angry, shove her to the ground, and kick her in the abdomen. This incident temporarily put him behind bars for one day as the judge set his bail to $2,500 and ordered him to refrain from alcohol abuse and criminal activity. He was able to secure a bond by putting up 10% or $250 and was released June 1st, but that would not stop his criminal activities. Soon after the murders, Aaron bought a one-way bus ticket to West Palm Beach, where he had family members. On June 14th, 
he was detained by the Orlando Police Department at a Greyhound station after they were notified of his plans by the Tallahassee police. After complaining about having trouble breathing, he was taken to a hospital. There he confessed to the police about the two murders, once to officers who were guarding him and again to his mother in a phone call. Later that day, Tallahassee police arrived in Orlando to interview him, and he openly confessed to everything. He said that around 6 p.m., he met Toyin at a bus stop where he casually struck up a conversation with her. She told him that earlier that day, she had been sexually assaulted as she also publicly tweeted. She also mentioned that she did not have a permanent place to stay. Aaron then offered to take her to his house to bathe and rest. Assuming he had better intentions, Toyin likely agreed, and that is when he called Victoria Sims for a ride back to his place. After talking for about an hour, Victoria arrived around 7 p.m. and transported them to Aaron's rundown home. His story at this point was corroborated by surveillance footage. After they were dropped off, Victoria left and Toyin went inside the home to take a shower. Upon getting out, Aaron said he attempted to engage her in sexual activities. Toyin said no and tried to fight him off as he said she bit him on his right forearm during the struggle, but eventually he overpowered her. He was asked if he would characterize his actions as rape, and he responded in the affirmative. He then said he kept Toyin tied up and imprisoned in his home for approximately three to five days, but wasn't too sure of how long because he was heavily under the influence of alcohol. He only ever released her to eat and bathe and admitted to sexually assaulting her numerous times during the time period. He stated that he was aware that he would be arrested and likely sentenced to prison if he allowed Toyin to leave his residence, so he determined that his only course of action was to end her life. See, this was the deal with her. I was afraid that she was going to scream rape once I let her go. So I kept her there a couple of days. I can't remember how many days. I kept her a couple of days. And, uh, every time when I would leave, it was This thought process is sadly common among many murderers and never made sense to me personally because they end up in jail anyways and for much longer too since they actively chose taking their victims' lives along with their other crimes committed against them already. However, I digress. His method of unaliving her was tying her up in a way with rope that made it extremely difficult for her to breathe and left her in his bedroom. Over the course of several hours, he would re-enter the room multiple times to see if Toyin was still alive. Ultimately, he entered the bedroom one last time and found her deceased. Realizing that Vicky witnessed him and Toyin on the night of her disappearance, he felt that he needed to get rid of Vicky as well. On June 12th, he unknowingly arrived at Victoria's place, ransacked her home, kidnapped her in her own vehicle, and then ended her life. On June 14th, a woman who went by Ashley on Twitter and previously indicated that she was helping Toyin's mother in her search, wrote, I'm sorry to inform everyone about this, but Toyin is no longer with us. The news sent hashtag justice for Toyin and hashtag say her name trending on Twitter, where everyone expressed their anger and shock at her murder, including celebrities like Gabrielle Union, Kerry Washington, Common, and Chloe and Halley. They held a funeral service for Vicky on June 26th, in a funeral service for Toyin on June 27th, where they were both laid to rest. Aaron was brought back to Tallahassee to face two counts, each of murder and kidnap and one count of sexual assault. 
the judge ordered that Aaron was held without bail as he is a danger to society. State prosecutors are seeking the death penalty and he still sits in prison as a trial date has not been set. The stark irony for Toyin to have protested defending black lives, for her to not be safe by men in her own community in the span of one singular day, emphasizes the demand to protect black women. What also makes this story particularly heartbreaking is that as much as Toyin was a victim of Erin Glee, her marginalization, being cut off from her family, a safe home, and a place to sleep, meant that she was more easily targeted by her abusers and murderer. Her murder motivated Brianna Baker, an executive director and founder of Justice for Black Girls, to found the Freedom Fighters Fund. The fund supports black women under the age of 25 who can request grants up to $750 for overnight housing, rent relief, food, or other life-sustaining support. Even more heartbreaking was the potential the world got to see of Toyin for her life to be robbed from her only days later. May you rest in paradise, Alua Toyin and Victoria, and thank you all for watching. <laughs>